So, what are your questions? Yeah. I'd like to know that when you were interested in getting the Kansas City market, I don't call it the recording. Anyway, how did you assess, say, the actual rents? So, how did we evaluate the Kansas City market? I think is the is the question. I don't know if we did a lot of evaluation. I just went there and I realized, oh my gosh, houses here are selling for thirty thousand, thirty-five thousand, forty-five thousand dollars, and they rent for seven fifty, eight fifty, maybe even nine hundred a month. And so to me, it didn't take long for that rent to cost ratio to kick in and say, if you can figure out property management in this environment, you've got a viable business. And property management is the key, particularly when you're going out of state. I would never encourage somebody just to buy some properties in Tennessee or Kentucky or Texas or wherever, who's not gonna take this really seriously and have their property management piece figured out because that is what will kill you when you buy out of state. There are so many people who've gone out of state as out of state investors and banks of course now are very reluctant to lend to the out of state investors for good reason. Many people have just lost money by doing that. And so you've got to have it, Travis has figured it out by having somebody on the ground in, in Mobile, Alabama, who is doing the property management, who's a partner and to figure out a, a connection with somebody doing it is really critical. Rehabs and acquisitions is exciting and flashy, but a good deal isn't worth anything if you can't retain and extract value from the asset. The most underrated but important aspect of a buy and hold strategy is property management and maintenance. In Kansas City, we own our office and rent a shop and garage just down the street from which we coordinate everything from leasing properties to fixing toilets. Our office manager, Rachel Savitsky, oversees our office team while Taylor Rhodes, our construction manager, is out in the field overseeing our rehab and maintenance crews. We also use aggressive marketing and branding strategies to give ourselves an advantage in the marketplace. Now our company name is Stewardship Properties. It's a name I really love because it reminds me of how we need to take care of what has been entrusted to us. But in Kansas City, our property management company is known as 333RENT, our easy to remember phone number and our website. 333rent.com. Were there uh, were there other investors in the Kansas City area that were using your strategy that were making lots of low offers on the foreclosures in the city? There are. We have a advantage, and that is, banks are in a catch-22 situation in Kansas City, and they are in other other Midwest markets. Uh, Indian, Indianapolis is a is a good one. I mean, there's so many Memphis, Tennessee. There's there's lots of these kind of cash flow markets, is what I'd call them. So, banks have been burned tremendously. So they're not their criteria for lending is way up. Uh, they don't like to make loans where you know they're loaning out thirty thousand dollars on a forty thousand dollar purchase. I mean, that's like a car loan to a lot of people. Uh, they want it to season for a year to two years before they even loan on the property. So, I mean, now in that environment, cash is king. If you can find money from private lenders, then you can really grow a business. And that's what we've tried to do. And so we do feel like, so, you know, some investors are doing onesies and twosies. We've tried to, you know, build our private lender list and buy money and buy properties through using their borrowed funds. Why are people renting rather than buying there? Because they're also in a catch-22 situation. They Oftentimes their credit's been hurt, you know, because of what they've been through. Also, most of these properties that we're buying need five to ten thousand dollars, maybe more, of fix-up. And so a normal homeowner doesn't have that kind of cash to fix these up. So so banks are and banks don't want to make these small loans. I mean, there's no money in it for them. You know, to make a loan to a homeowner for twenty-five thousand dollars, who wants to do that as a as a banker? So it's really, you know, again, a niche market. There are factors in this market that make it work. You know, for the investor walking into it. Again, what are the factors that you're looking for in your niche market that's going to make it work? Campus <laughs> rental properties worked great during the '90s. I'm not sure, sir during the uh, 2013 and following, they'll work as well. But w it's working because of low interest bank loans is why it's still working there. And now we've got a glut of properties on the market, but you know, that's how the real estate cycle works essentially. But what's, what's it gonna make, what's gonna be that value play for you? Can you elaborate a little bit in 
numbers between value property, <laughs> equity property, and yeah. cash flow property? Well, again, it's kind of, I would almost. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Can you, can you, thank you, Shandor. Can you uh, describe a little bit more between cash flow property, value property, and equity property? Again, we're talking at the lower middle to the middle, all right? I'm not talking about B property and A property that you know, you're going to see in the South Hills or, or wherever. Those properties can be bought, but they're not going to cash flow worth buying, okay, generally. So the lowest end properties that you would want to buy that would be out of war zones would be cash flow properties. That was, and I can't give you a number exactly what those would be. I don't know, maybe we could speculate in Springfield, Eugene, what that, what that would cost, maybe between a, uh, 75 to 100, and 100 maybe, and then you're going up to value properties would be 100 to 145 maybe, and then from there, 145 up. It really depends, is it a duplex, is it a single family, is it what is it exactly? So it's hard to say, I'm just kind of, Guess, guess the mating here. Specific to Kansas City, do you have a whole strategy going in as far as how long you're going to be invested in that area? Or do you just reevaluate year by year or as real estate trends? So again, I go back to the axiom in my own mind. Is the question? Yeah. Do we, <laughs> I thought it was, it was hearable. Do we have a strategy going in about buy and holding or are we going to sell at some point in time is the question. My axiom as a buy and hold strategist in the real estate world is that if I don't need the money, why would I ever sell it? Now there may be some reasons, but why would I ever sell it? There's some great tax advantages for keeping it, aren't there? You know, depreciation and so forth and so on. So, so uh, we don't have an endpoint in terms of se selling these properties. Maybe we'll come to that. Uh, may, if there's other opportunities that you want the cash for, and you can't get it any other way but to sell this property, yes, that would necessitate a sale and it would make it worthwhile. <laughs> Buy and flip is a complex operation because you have to be really good at buying, negotiating, marketing, all the things that go into buying. Then you have to do the rehab, right? And then you have to, you can pass it off to, to a broker if you want, but you have to be kind of good at that back end too, the, the selling part of it, getting it in really great shape so that perfect buyer wants that perfect house. It's, it's more complicated actually than the buy and hold market. The buy, what's complicated about buy and hold is finding the money. How do you find the money to keep that machine move, going, kind of thing, and growing? Do you have all of your properties in a trust? I, I do, yeah, we, we have it in a trust. So do you, I have all of our properties in a trust? And I would really encourage a trust at some level because you, you uh, avoid, your kids avoid probate. They don't have to wait six months or whatever time period as the state figures their thing out. And so putting them in a trust is a real advantage. They just, they immediately own the properties. They own the trust. The other thing is if your net worth is at a certain level and we're talking about a fairly high level, then you don't have tax consequences. Actually the federal tax consequence, the death tax, inheritance tax as they call it, is not so bad. You can pass on 5 million individually and, and uh, 10 million as a couple. In Oregon, however, it's like at a million dollars or something. Their inheritance tax kicks in. If, you've, if, you're, if that's an issue for you, that's what's going to get you, you know, besides death, that'll get you too, but <laughs> is, it, that's what's going to get your kids is the Oregon inheritance tax, which kicks in way lower than the federal inheritance tax kicks in. So, so the bulk of your properties aren't as is. You're still, you're still in, in Kansas City, for example, you're still competing against the retail buyer when you're purchasing products, right? Well, there's more than one market. And maybe, why don't we have Amanda speak to that, actually? Uh, we're, uh, sorry, Amanda will, will repeat the question, then she'll speak to that. <laughs> Come on up, Amanda. About competing with the retail market? Well, yeah. specifically, when you're talking about purchasing these homes at such reduced rates and only putting in six or seven thousand dollars worth of, of rehab money, um, they're relatively just cosmetic fixes, aren't they? It's not. We have our issues. and so in the when, in the beginning, see, and that's a good question. In the beginning, uh, we it was really easy to get those twenty. Actually, I mean, we bought things as low as fifteen thousand dollars that just needed that cosmetic 
the, the markets appreciate it. And so our price point has moved up a bit. And then we also, um, you know, starting in 2011, we had um, one maintenance guy who was really unskilled. Um, we had a uh, construction crew that was not probably top of the line. Right now, I think we're running about six contractors and we have uh, 10 full-time staff that eight of them are doing like basically full-time rehab. So we've upped our game as far as what we're doing. You know, we're more willing to go in and uh, finish basements, add bedrooms, put more money into the properties to mm -hmm. add value because the properties are increasing in value. We can feel the appreciation in the market and competition, um, you know, prices go up. We have to raise our offers. And so, you know, there are more people in the market that are competing at those prices. And so the great deals are fewer and further right. to come by, but the good deals are still <laughs> out there, you know, every day. And some of you may even feel like, okay, it's hit the bottom here in Eugene and Springfield and it's starting to jump up. Of course, you never know a year from now where the real estate market is going to be just like the stock market. But it's never, as long as the property cash flows, it's never, you're never too late to the party. You know, it's not like you, oh, you missed the bottom of the market somehow and, and now you gotta wring your hands over it. The thing not to miss is to get into the market. That's the thing you don't wanna miss. It'd be great to hear from you how you foresee the near future of our real estate market as far as appreciation and just the general. Well, that'd be interesting. A lot of people could speak to this, I think. Uh, I would say that low interest rates are fueling our real, uh, the appreciation in the real estate market right now. The question is, are we creating another bubble? I don't, I don't know if I could answer that. I don't think so yet, because prices still are 30% lower than they were at the top of the boom, right? So I don't know if we're creating a mini bubble with low interest rates. Didn't we do that low interest rate thing before one time? Yeah, I think we did. Uh, <laughs> So it was five instead of three, though. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so, but I think there's still uh, there's a lot of pent up demand at this point, and I think there's some real genuine appreciation in the market. I think we've seen a historic low point all over the country, and now we're coming up from it. But again, you haven't missed it. You know, it's not like if you didn't buy at that low point, you've missed it. Look for the value plays. Uh, you know, look. You don't want to buy property at retail. You want to buy it at wholesale. My well, another one of my big axioms was, any property I bought, I wanted to make sure that the day after I bought it, I could resell it with a broker commission, and not lose any money. If I'm convinced of that, that property is worth considering. What is the maximum that you would pay a private lender interest? <laughs> What's the maximum we would pay a private lender interest? You know. It's depending on the deal, I guess I would say any interest and any amount of points might be worth it. If you if you thought that deal was that valuable because of where you were buying at it or what you could do to it, then in some ways the price of the money is irrelevant. Now, having said that, <laughs> having said that, I would say one of the axioms in our office is that we try to keep our cost of funds as low as possible. So. What does it mean to keep your cost of funds low when you're going out to the private lending market? Well, you're asking, you're trying to find people who are not necessarily hard money brokers who are asking for points and fairly high interest rates. And to do that, you probably have to stop, start with mom and pop because they're probably going to charge you the best, you know, interest rate on your money. My dad certainly did. At times it's been 0% and that's a really good interest rate. And thankfully, he didn't get in trouble with Uncle Sam because that's really gifting me money is what that's doing. So uh, you got to start there. And then you kind of enlarge your circle of people who would maybe trust you if they, if they felt you had a good product, you had a good thing. And, and they're not going to probably ask for quite as much in terms of interest rates. Our particular number that we've settled on is 9%. Just to settle on a number. First mortgage. Or mortgage? First mortgage. Although I've, I've borrowed plenty of money in second position at nine to 10% as well. Again, does the cash flow warrant this loan is what a lender is asking. Uh, but generally uh, first position money uh, and no points. But, but we, that's our business. I mean, we're every day we're networking with private lenders looking for folks who would jump on board with us and loan on the properties that we showed in the presentation. Yeah. 
in general, where do you find the great deals? Well, boy, there's a number of people could. I think marketing is the key here. And, uh, you know, we could go through a whole class on how do you market to uh, potential sellers. If possible, you want sellers calling you. When I was first starting with campus rental properties, I'd take flyers around the campus area where I knew homeowners were living, but it was right outside the campus area. And I'd put flyers on doors, say, hey, I'm looking for a property in this neighborhood to buy. I put ads in the paper. Uh, you know, I would talk to friends. I would pass out my business cards. I would tell everybody I knew, I'm, I'm looking for a house to buy that is a, fix, is a fixer or is in the campus area. And so again, and somebody all of a sudden calls me, you know. Boy, when they call you, you know that all of a sudden you're an exclusive. It's likely they haven't put it on the market. They haven't, you know, figured out a big strategy in selling it. They're just calling you, responding to your marketing, and now they want to talk face to face to you. And you probably have the best shot at that point to buy the best price property you could you could buy. So. Oh. And in Kansas City, we're using probably 90% is through a broker. He's um, kind of our guy. He almost works full time for us. Um, Andrew, one of Bill's sons and partners, goes on uh, like three days a week. He, they just drive around and look at properties and make offers. That's what they do. <laughs> and that's really a good point. You know, if you can find an investment minded broker, grab a hold of them. You know, a lot of brokers orient themselves to new homeowner market, uh, move up market upper end of market, whatever, you, you don't, you don't want to waste their time and you don't want them wasting your time. Look for an invested minded broker, somebody who is going to tell you, I don't think that's a good enough deal for you to buy. Those numbers don't really work for your, your criteria. So I have had only a few, but they have been so helpful. For years I had one here, we had one in Salem and we have one in Kansas City. And we've just kind of latched onto them like you're our guy or you're our gal because, you know, you you tell us what we want to hear, not what you, th you know, to get the, the sale or, or some retail kind of purchase here. But you know what we want and you're always looking for it. So and we understand that we're not a one time person in the market. And so it has to be good. They don't want to just make the sale. They want us to be successful because if we're successful, that means repeat business for them. So good point. they have to understand that. Yeah. Were they hesitant at first to be making large numbers of offers that were really low where they knew that most of them were going to be rejected? How, how, did, how did you make them willing? Yeah, again, a, an investor broker needs to be willing to kind of fall on the sword for you. And that is making a lot of offers and uh, realizing that, you know, they're going to get repeat business, but they're going to be doing a lot of work to do that. So there's a plus and minus and some of them. That's what makes an investment minded broker. I think right there, they're willing to kind of get into the mindset of an investor. And that mindset is I want to buy wholesale. I want to buy wholesale. I want to buy wholesale. So that means a lot of offers. It means uh, the numbers are all that matters. There's no emotional attachment here. This is not my dream home. It's the numbers. What, was the num what were the numbers? You said you wrote over 300 offers, and what was the number that you actually were accepted? 10%. 10%? 10 yeah. So, so that's a lot of offers for that. Yeah. Did you buy 10% or? Yeah, we, we purchased 10%. We got contracts on 10%. We purchased almost all of them. Now, Travis, how many offers did you make last year, Travis? <laughs> you want to talk about offers. Different, different you, model, but um, thousands. He's got a virtual assistant in the Philippines working for him, making offers, and they're uh, on HUD homes. Uh, he, he, if you want to learn more about making offers, Travis is the expert in this area, so I would talk to him. But again, the more offers, the more a bank in a, in a bank-owned REO property is going to respond for whatever reason. It's a mystery what happens in banks and what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and HUD are doing when they sell REO properties, you never know when you're just going to hit the right number and the right time. And the committee has sat down and said, yeah, we'll take that. You just never know. But making lots of offers. Liz, you had a... Well, I was, I, I was going to say, if anyone can latch on to a person that's willing to work with you, I was that person for over 20 years for one client. And I made a lot of offers, but that's how I'm retiring right now. And they were just gold. 
those clients. And if you can find somebody like that, you know, I didn't care whether they got the deal or didn't get the deal. It was, it was always the next one, next one, next one. So you just kind of do it, do it. Do Boy, it. and that's, that's what a broker has to have to be an in, a broker for an investor. Well, I don't care if they get the deal. They were yeah. Bad. They closed the deal, and that was also. When they bought it, they closed it. They closed it with cash on time, on the money. Mm -hmm. And to curry favor with a broker and not waste their time, you've got to be ready to step up to the plate and, and make the purchase, close the deal, and move ahead. Mm -hmm. So you've got to keep your end of the bargain as well. Yeah. So, Bill, I know you were talking about that if the deal's good enough and the rent to cost ratio is low enough, then you take a, a junior loan or second position or loan. You take out not just the primary, but the secondary. So, but I was wondering, you also mentioned that leverage is key. So when you take out that loan on your first one, obviously you can use private money, hard money, but on the second one, typically I found that when I talked to say for Susan Capital, they would mm -hmm. only want to do 70% of what you're right. going to buy. So that remaining 30%, when you were starting out, did you, how did you fund that? Who did you go to, to so you could have maximum leverage? Well, that was, this was a different era when I was doing it back in the late 80s and early 90s. What, what did we do to basically fund our properties, particularly, okay, you still have to come up with 30%, 25% or 30%. How do you cover that amount of money? That is really a key question too. How, because you just don't want to buy one deal. You want to buy that deal and buy the next deal. So what are the strategies of coming up that, well, maybe you're going to need a partner first, a person who's going to go in and they're going to get 50% of the deal, but they're going to bring the money. So, you know, if you got, if you can connect yourself with a money partner, and you're the guy who's going to be on the ground looking for the properties, do so. Uh, it, so what are some other strategies? So uh, another one is what kind of value play? I mean, making multiple offers is kind of a value play because when you hit one, it's such a good deal, hopefully, that you're going to have built-in equity from the start, more than 10%, maybe more than 20%, maybe more than 30% built-in equity from the day you buy it. That's a good deal. And all of a sudden, you can maybe borrow 100% from some people because you have built-in equity. That's key. Travis, do you have any other thoughts about that? About the 30%. Um, the big key is getting it at a deep discount because when we talk to private lenders, they go by the house, some of them, and they want comps. And so if the comps say 60 and you're asking for 35 or 40, yeah. they're they're fine. They're good. Yeah. You know, real estate investment starts with a good deal, maybe a great deal. That can't be overstated. You got to find the good and great deals. That's where it starts. That's where you can bring people onto your team, whether they're money, you know, they have money to help fund you or whatever. That's where it starts. Yeah, Leah, you had a. Seller carryback. Thank you. Yeah, Leah says seller carryback. Again, that's not a bad. Not every seller will do that. Not every seller can do that. I don't know if you've gotten into subject to the existing financing. This is a little interesting strategy, but uh, buying a property and building the trust level with a seller that they stay on the mortgage, but that you become owner of the property, it's you're buying it subject to their current loan. Boy, that I don't even want to talk about that with bankers here, but <laughs> it's, it's a strategy that can work. And uh, yeah, this is not a traditional lender over here, so. Uh, that's, it's called a wrap. It's called a wrap, right? Yeah. We, we did it in the 80s because we had to do it, basically. And then it kind of resurfaced here in the 2000s, that kind of strategy. We had to do it in the 80s because the interest rate was so high from traditional lenders that you had to find a way to wrap existing mortgages and keep that lower interest uh, for yourself. Even though somebody was selling you the property, you wanted to keep their interest rate. The banker can call the loan. Yeah, it's possible. It never happens, never but happens, it, yeah. But if, the seller so has equity, if the seller has equity, then they can carry back a second note on the, on the additional right. equity. That's also a possibility. So if they have 30% equity and they're willing to just buy out their first loan and just carry back that 30% equity, there's your 30%. Or maybe make the seller your partner, you know? Yeah. That's a possibility as well. How do you do that, getting somebody with money to make him his partner? What is the formula? Because usually people want you to put money also. They want you to have skin, skin in the game is what you're saying? You mean 
or, or uh, like if you want to buy a property and you want to have a farm and will manage it or do something with it, uh, you want him to put little money too. So how do, what is the formula? That one you know, I don't know if there is any formula. I think you just kind of make it up as you go along. So whatever skills and abilities you bring to it, and if you have a partner, whatever skills and abilities they bring to it, who has the money, where you can get the money, who's, you know, I, I had a partner and his mother loaned us a bunch of money, uh, which allowed us to get into the property one time here in Eugene. And, you know, I, I didn't know his mom had money, but we were strategizing, strategizing how to borrow, buy this property together. He said, you know, my mom's got $120,000. She could loan on this. Okay, let's, let's take that, you know, let's do that. So, yeah. That's an, I'm, that's an excellent point that you brought up because what I'd like to ask is when you, don't go, when you go outside of established Harmony private money lenders, how do you get that paperwork that makes everything legal and tax efficient? So they can, you can sign off, they can sign off. You know, co come, come and talk to Amanda and I about that. We, we can uh, help you through it. Travis could help you as well, I'm sure. That's the easy part of it. The, the paperwork is by far not something to worry about because other people are expert at that. They can take care of it. You're going to have an escrow agent in your team. You know, you're going to have insurance people on your team, you know, because uh, the private lender is going to want to be on as an additional insured on your property in case it burns down, that you're just not going to take the, the insurance money and go to Tahiti with it. They want to have a say in how it's used. So, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have the expertise around you to, to make the paperwork work. Anything else? Well, thank you. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you.